Hit it. Welcome to Polymuse. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for welcoming me to Polymuse. Polymuse is an experience. It's a podcast. It's a lifestyle where we take you track by track, album by album, through the artists that we know and love. We are deep into season one. We're doing Linkin Park. One more light live. I'd like to introduce myself to you, the audience. My name is Ben. I am a music lover, music maker. We're going to do a, a album review for you. And now I'm going to kick it over to my co-host. Hi, I am Michael. I am the co-host. I am a music fighter. So we're lovers and fighters here. Uh-huh. Yep. So cousin and co-host. So today, the One More Light tour album of Linkin Park. One More Light Live. One More Light Live. Obviously the follow-up to the... One More Light. Not live. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> The last full project by Linkin Park released in 2017. Mm -hmm. This live album was released December 17th of 2017, a few months after the May release of One More Light, and just a couple months after the July death of Chester Bennington, frontman, unfortunately. So this was done to kind of show off the tour but also as explicitly done as a tribute to chester correct they did have a piece in there that was written to explain that yep they did have a statement dedicating this live album specifically to chester and all the hard work they put in this tour was originally started overseas it was a european leg of the tour so they made it through about 21 shows, festivals, number of different venues spreading all over the place. We had Belgium, we had Germany, we had France. We had just a slew of, of different areas they were able to hit. Unfortunately, once they got to the end of that run, in between that and the continuation here in the United States, uh, we lost Chester. I'm still so sad about it, dude. It doesn't feel like it was four years ago. I was getting back into them at the time, like I was listening to One More Light, and it was just such a screwed up, such a screwed up way for his story to end, and it's a lot of the stuff on here is more heavy because of that, I mean, it's, he's not always singing about his own problems on some of this stuff even. I think it's awesome how they... They really pick a bunch of their new styles on this and really kind of show off a lot of what they were capable of. So it's cool that they, you know, a lot of people were not digging One More Light. So I'm glad that they did this as kind of a wrap up, even through the grief of losing Chester, being able to revisit some of the music and look back at it and, and do one more album like this is a good thing. Yeah, I think it was a good decision. They certainly released live material with almost every full studio album that they did as well. Uh, so this actually started in South America. They did just a handful of tour dates there, then continued in Europe. So this is a 16-track album. The full set list was closer to 25 songs on a given night, a little less than that. Kind of depend, depends on, on the evening. So they, they brought it back to 16 tracks. It's very heavy uh, on One More Light specifically. Not all the tracks are in order. They're cut from different shows. So this isn't a start to finish one show recording. It's a collection of tracks that were performed as the normal set list, but they are from different shows, not necessarily in order. So just different cuts from different nights. Just just different different cuts, different nights. There is no set visual that they put together no dvd or blu-ray with this project there's tons of footage online that you can find even of these specific tracks that made the album that we were able to match up so lots of material online and they mike and several of the engineers that helped pick out the tracks for this specific album had that in mind that there's plenty of clips out there but we're just going to put out an audio album for this project you just get one more taste of of the magic it's their new sound it's their pop sound there's almost there's no metal on here it's a pop album there is some rock and stuff 
but it's it's not hip hop either. It's pop and it's that trappy snappy snap beat and other stuff. They go back to some of the some of the Transformers songs and stuff like that, but it's not metal at all. No. I I like it though. I like it as well, but it's very much away from far away from the original Lincoln Park, the hybrid theory, and there's no hunting party for this specific selection on the album, and there wasn't much hunting party, if any at all, in the original track listing. So they stayed away from that, and it is very much more, very much of a pop sound. Almost all the tracks from One More Light, I think a couple of them are missing, but I think it's 8 out of the 10. Uh, I believe it's, yeah, eight, I think 9 out of the 10, so there are only a couple tracks of One More Light that were never performed live. Pretty much all of them made the One More Light live. Tour. I think this is better than One More Light. I think the songs, they work better live for some reason. Even the ones where the records we were kind of iffy about are, they're powerful. And it's the it's that energy that we're always talking about where they're trying to get a stadium rock energy where they can have everyone feeling the same thing and experiencing the same thing and all through the notes, all through the music. You can take people on a journey. You can touch that many people all at once. And they don't have visuals and explosion. It's not a movie. It's all just the notes that they play and being able to do that type of songwriting. And it, the One More Light stuff is a lot better on here than on some of the studio stuff, I think. Yeah, it's very much the stadium experience, as you stated, and we've talked about many times over. And they do a great job of doing a few different arrangements on some of the tracks, as is typical for most bands and most live performances. But they do an especially great job of that on certain tracks, stripping them down, and they just do some some great arrangements. But it's interesting that they, they, they're they always going different directions, even yeah. in their live shows, to choose to go away from some of the guitars, some of the guitars, yeah. some of the drums, and just go with more electronic and samples, even if it is closer to their most recent album. But some of the other older tracks on this are just treated differently as well. Yeah, you can't mosh to any of this at all. And I think Mike must play piano on like every single song. There's, it seems like there's a little extra synth part in almost all of these. Like almost all of them have some little extra little nugget in there, either a vocal harmony or a keys part. So it's cool that they don't have to be like heavy to be heavy in another sense. Like they're not, it's not heavy metal music, but the emotions are heavy. And even the songs where it's just Chester singing with a piano, the, his, the heaviness of the lyrics and the melody and the way he's singing it and the way it's all arranged and put together is it's a heavy experience in a totally different way. Obviously not a mosh pit thing, but He's got a powerful voice, man. Like, obviously, yeah. we've said it a thousand times, but it's another... He's obvi- He's the star of all these songs. None of the... You get some Joe Hahn. I think Joe is controlling all those weird, like, baby voices and distorted voices and stuff. He's probably the one making sure all that <laughs> gets pulled off. But not a lot of guitar. You know, I always want the drummer to do more work in this band. I always feel like he could add a little more sauce, a little more oomph to some of it some yep. of the time. And he obviously he's working with the samples and with the whole arrangement and with the DJ. But point I'm making, Chester is the star. It's very much a Chester show. We it, pull away from Mike a lot. We pull away from the rapping a lot besides a few a few tracks. And even looking at the, the full set list uh, on any given night, it still probably wasn't very Mike heavy. And it's very, a lot of singing, not as much, I just, again, no, no guitars, really. no screaming, yeah. no drums, not as much rap. Not as much just rap. Just stripping away a lot of what we know Lincoln Park to be, despite the fact that they're constantly changing styles. This was very much... It's the new school. Yeah. Very much shredding away a lot of different layers. This was a very specific Lincoln Park lane for this tour. I'm glad that's how they did it. It. They pull it off. It's a cool sound. It's a journey. It's a, There's a lot of layers to it and a lot of good sounds that they pull off live. A lot of good synths, a lot of good vocal stuff. They really take you through every different mood, even on this pop stuff where you'd think it was normally, you know, kind of 
cheesy or whatever, but this is a show. Like it's not necessarily like a Broadway musical or a movie or something like that, but they know how to pace it out. They know how to, and I know it's not from one show, but they're at that level of entertainment where they can take you through that roller coaster of different sounds, different emotions, even within this more specific, you know, sound that they're going for. They can still do all kinds of stuff with it. Like there's all kinds of stuff going on on this thing. It's awesome. Yeah. And we haven't covered every individual tour, you know, they've done in between like the hunting party, but even covering just the live different live albums that they've done, they're just very different tastes and they've certainly evolved, I think in stage presence and what you hear. And this is a much more raw sound. Yeah, it is. It's not, which is awesome. It is. It sounds like you're at a show. Yeah. Whereas, you know, there's not always a balance in the audio, I think between what you're hearing instrumentally or even vocally, Mm -hmm. like it may sound like you're more on one side of the stage or the audience may feel a little disproportionate. Right. So certainly when I was listening to this, I'm like, where is the sound coming from? Mm. Yeah. I don't think they went over and remixed it or anything. It's probably just kind of the rough audio that they had coming out of the soundboard or whatever they had. And I think it was kind of rushed. They kind of feels like it was a little thrown together, but they, you know, they wanted to do a tribute to Chester. They wanted to right. commemorate the the part of the tour that they had completed. And I mean, the amount of practice and thought and different layers, it's the layers, man, the layers of stuff that they're pulling off live and with triggered samples and with different instruments and different vocals. And it's too bad it got cut short. It's too bad, you know, the whole career had to come to a halt. It's it's just a tragedy. And we'll always miss Chester. We'll always remember he's the voice of a generation. And that's the truth. He's He grew up with us. Yeah. But let's dig into some of the last live performances of the full group here. So right off the bat on the album, you hear the crowd chanting Lincoln Park, Lincoln Park, Lincoln Park, Lincoln Park, Lincoln Park. Kind of awesome. Then they play a sample of the Roads Untraveled song, which was one of my favorite songs. I think it's one of their best kind of power ballads. But here it's just like a distorted voice. And it just amps you up, dude. It's like a great intro, a great kind of prelude to get you pumped, to get you like, you're just locked into their world, man. It's like the lyrics grab you, the voice grabs you. It's not necessarily like the guitars or the rhythm or like any of that, but they're just bringing you into the whole world with just the lyrics, just the like, it's like an organ and an alien voice. Well, your walk-up song or video or intro or however you decide to welcome yourself to the stage is a big deal. And this is a song that didn't have a full performance anywhere on the tour, I don't believe. And it doesn't get a full, certainly a full helping on this this album either, obviously. So it's cool to kind of get, kind of sneak it in here in the beginning. Great. To, to kind of feed it, you know, as the everyone's coming onto the stage to kind of, hey, we're, we're starting the show now, guys. Here we go. So it's kind of nice to have. I always kind of like it when they have some kind of robot voice or the distortion or some kind of little build to kind of get you going. Yeah, a vamp or a build or yeah. some some kind of thing. Some kind of thing. That's you know, <laughs> yeah. That's what they know how to do. Some kind of way. Yeah, about it. It feeds us right into talking to myself. Yeah, the same chord is the first chord of talking to myself. Rocks. This song rocks. It's the only rock song on One More Light. I ranked it, I think, higher than most of the other ones. I was right. This is like, it's so fire. It's so hype. They picked it for the opener, and it works. Man, it just hits right off the bat. You got a hit song. It sounds exactly like the album. We get nice Chester vocals right at the beginning, as you do with the album version. And Sounds great. I like that the instrumentation is is calm at the beginning of the song. So that's what you get. You get chest, you get the vocals right off the bat without anything too wild. And I prefer to hear his yep. voice. As we stated, it's very much a Chester vocal performance as opposed to what's going on instrumentally. At least that certainly feels that way to me. And it's certainly more than any mic vocals. So to, to kind of bring him in at least the first few seconds 
and to a song that very much focuses on him lyrically in the beginning, I think is a good choice. The instruments sound really raw. You got some raw drums, some raw bass, and like an organ in there. Sounds great. It's like a really good, crunchy, live sound that is just really fun to listen to all the different layers that they're pulling off. Chester sounds great. The guitar sounds great. It bangs. It rocks. We're not going to rank these because we don't rank the live versions, but I really like the organ part on this. The weird distorted alien vocals. I'm assuming Johan is triggering those. Those are, they're kind of cool. It's like they're part of their new sound. I kind of get it. Very good track right off the bat. Should mention out of these, I think 21 performances that there were a number, number of festivals in here. So I don't know that every single one started with this quite the same. I don't know that every single one started with roads untraveled. Sure, but this one does. Yes. And that's good. It is very good. Then we burn it down from living things. Yes. You got burned it down. I was uh, not a fan of this one, but you were a big fan of this one. I yeah. Think. Is that right? That is right. This is how we did it. We're going to do a recap episode, folks. <laughs> the next episode after this will be a recap where we go back over our rankings yeah. and reflect. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. I like the song. I think this is the stage that it's meant for. Yeah. And I think it's a great throwback to have right as your kind of second track. I kind of like it breaking it up because right after this, we go into a hot streak of one more light again. So I kind of like it breaking up everything right here. I think this is kind of a good good place for it. And we have a lot of Chester vocals right in the beginning again on a song that kind of ebbs and flows yeah. on the chorus with how the inst does. instruments come in and out. Not a power ballad. No. Again, very strong on... Chester vocals. It's kind of the focus of the song when everything kind of drops out in the verse. It's cool. Not my favorite Linkin Park song. It's a hit. It's good that they get it out the way as track two. That's a good idea. And you bring in Mike with his rapping again. You do that early. Yep. To kind of remind you get you him in the mix. Yeah. Remind that he you, hey. used to rap. <laughs> uh, but he doesn't do that a whole lot in this the album selection here that we're looking at of sixteen tracks. And I don't believe he, he did that much for the live performances of maybe 25-ish songs either. Got track three, Battle Symphony. Chester starts by thanking the audience, which is nice of him. Then they go in. It's It sounds good. It sounds more raw. It sounds more real. It's got a crispier sound than the album version. I like the more live-sounding organ stuff. I'm assuming Mike is just playing like tons of of organ all over this maybe it's samples there's some like really good organ tones you can finally hear him playing i think he was not as confident at keys on some of the stuff before but this is great the way he's filling out the mix the way he's kind of <laughs> well it sounds a lot better than the album version i think i just wasn't That's i thought it was kind of bland on the album yeah i i heard <laughs> i heard every bit of that coming out of your mouth <laughs> No, it's it sounds good here, and I'm sure live it sounded good as you know strong as well. It's a nice run here, you know, as stated. Battle Symphony, New Divide, Invisibles are going into the the album run here for the release. So you had a couple months to get and you know yeah acquainted with the album. So I think it's it's good to to flip back into this song selection that they did here. And it all bangs like it all is kind of equally as good. All the different songs they picked are kind of as they're all strong. Even the ones we didn't like as much on the albums. It's a strong they all work for this application. Now, it didn't always make the live set. Nobody can save me, which is track six on the live album here. Battle Symphony is number three, which we're on now. They were kind of flip flopped in and out of the set. So they didn't always both make the cut on the live set. But they set. both made the album on here. They sure did. So that's weird. It's because they're so similar, and they knew it. And we knew that when we heard the album. But they're both on here, and we'll get to that one on track six. But first they play, this is the Transformers song, right? New Divide? It's one of the Transformers songs. The crowd screams when they hit the riff for it. Everybody knows this one. This is never my favorite. It kind of bangs. Yeah. It's like that stompy rock style that they got into, like minutes to midnight feeling to it, you know. <laughs> yeah, from Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen. Revenge of the I, Fallen. I straight up missed this song in my notes. <laughs> so it's from 
It's from the movie soundtrack. Yeah. So it's a song that everyone loves and knows. Loves, knows, would have heard. We love the Transformers movies. Came out in 2000, movies. 2009. Yeah. Right. So it certainly had airplay. We haven't really touched on it because it didn't make a main album. It was just on the movie soundtrack. Oh. <laughs> so we actually haven't touched on this track. The drums sound great. The guitar sounds great. The samples sound great. They kind of have a lot of texture going on. It's a powerful song. It's a powerful record. It's good that they put this on there. Yeah, it's not the most exciting track, but it kind of fits in line with what they're doing here. <laughs> I guess they come off the One More Light sequence pretty quick here, but it sounds like the album version. So it's another strong track in that in that sense. I, I would have thought... Even with the new album outs, you hit the, the well-known Burn It Down early on, on track two, and then you dive into new material again. You add new divide in here quickly. It takes a while for them to dive deeper into the discography. I would have thought you would have incorporated that back in somewhere. And even on the, the full set list, they wait until way into the back half of the show to do that from what I found. I just thought you would have mixed like a crawling or in the end in more earlier. Just a thought. Invisible is track five. This was not our favorite on One More Light. We got Mike on some lead vocals. It's okay. They harmonize on here together, Mike and Cheddar, so that's good. Yeah. We always love that. They don't do it. They don't do it enough. They, they needed a vocal coach or something. They needed someone to make sure and get the other ones in there singing too, to they, line them up yes. and be like, you can, you can sing harmony. They needed a vocal coach. <laughs> yeah. They never had that, I don't think. Maybe they did, but obviously not, because Brad can sing. They can all sing. They yeah. just needed someone to be like to figure out the harmonies for them. I kind of liked it. I liked them all singing together. I, yeah. I think it is. The more voices, the better, period, in almost any band. Yeah, I think it kind of makes it more emotional when you hear everyone kind of sing it together. And it's. I think we were talking about how it builds the atmosphere in, the, in our previous episode. And I think this does... The same. Another song that sounds good in a live setting. So I actually think this does a good a good job where it's placed here. And then we got track six, Nobody Can Save Me. This is the one that's very similar to the trappy, snappy, post-dubstep, pop, 2010s, boom-tat, boom-tat beat that they rip off a million different times. Is this one better or worse than Battle Symphony? I don't know, man. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. They harmonize again, the two of the, the two vocalists, a little bit. The guitar sounds good on here. They got a lot of... It's about the texture, man. Something about the, the thing, just the sounds that they're able to get out of the different live instruments. They did a really good job. They did, yeah. I'm glad, at least for our listening purposes of this album, that between Battle Symphony and Nobody Can Save Me, they did break it up with Invisible and New Divide to give us a different sound. Otherwise it kind of sounds the, the same, same and gets a little twice, boring. Yeah. yeah. So at least they did a good job in arranging it here for us. You can certainly see why they might flip flop them in the live set. It's not my favorite track. It sounds similar to like it does on the album. What do you think about the weird alien voices? I keep talking about, it. I don't think you've really said you think it's weird. You think they're it's, it's part of the sound, but like, what is it? I know it comes from like modern pop music kind of sounding like that, but what are your thoughts on the alien voice? There's some in here. Yeah. Uh, it's it's some kind of synth. It's it's okay. Yeah. I don't it, I don't hear it as much as you do, I don't think. <laughs> I certainly singled it out in three or four tracks on the main album. I wasn't picking up on it on every single track until we discussed it. Yeah, it's certainly part of the song and i could certainly get how it sounds like children's voices at times <laughs> it gives johan something to do i'm pretty sure that's what's going on it's cool it's like his voice or the baby's voices from the album cover as i said on the last episode it's what i always think it's on every song <laughs> yeah well now, now i'll be thinking that too <laughs> except for this song one more light did they crush this they sing harmony they got really clean piano, really clean guitar. Chester hits every note, every it just all comes straight from the gut. It's perfect. Yeah. This song is great. It's terrific. And I mean, it's even more powerful like after 
it makes you think of Chester dying. I know it's about somebody else passing away, but it's it it's just such a insane yeah like well, grave marker for him essentially. It's right. like it's just the most beautiful song about grief essentially, and it, it's yeah. so insane that that is like was kind of his goodbye for himself. Grief is a part of life, and death is a part of life, and how he just felt grief so strongly of other people passing and he knew how how much life meant that's what this song is about it's not about death it's about how precious and special life is and i don't know what they wrote on chester's tombstone maybe we should have googled it but this is like the lyrics of this song is just the most beautiful thing you could ever read at a funeral for anyone really yeah there were certainly tracks that they performed live and some included on this album where they stripped down to just guitar or piano but this is the track that is meant to be just the big take your lighter out meaningful song and of course it does take a lot more meaning since he's gone and this is somewhere in the last month or two before he passed so this is just a this is a big song, even more so, I think, than the album recording. Yeah. It's one of the final live performances. Yeah, I agree. One More Light. It helps you get over or move you through, not get over, because you never get over, but you feel like you're not alone. You know that your grief is justified and, and that other people feel that and that life really is something to be cherished. It's a real, It's a real big deal and not in a cheesy way at all. And he's able to touch a whole stadium of people and communicate the whole grief thing. And it, and you enjoy it. That's what we I've wanted to mention it more often. How insane it is that so much of their lyrics and everything, not all of it, but a lot of it is so depressing and paranoid. And But it's entertaining. Yeah. And it's pop music. They make it into something that a whole audience wants to chant back to them. And it's just an amazing way to, you know, have an emotional connection. It's an amazing way to make art. That's what art is, right? They they yeah. really it's a piece of art, man. And this is really a very touching but also an uplifting, almost comforting song. Right. It comforts it's so sad that you feel comforted. <laughs> um, but of course, there are many videos of the tributes, but also the live, a couple of handfuls of live performances of this that you can find online, of course. Him jumping in with audience members and just the strength of the song and how it resonated with folks in the audience as well. Right after that, you get a good B-side to that. You get the piano version of Crawling. So another very deep, dark depressing exploration song where he's really laying it all out there but it's from their first record this does not sound like hybrid theory at all i think it's awesome that they put this back to back with one more light so it's kind of the new chester piano funeral song now the old chester piano like not a death song but kind of you know this is a dark one crawling is screwed up it is it's one of the couple hybrid theory tracks on the album just piano and vocals but it's just a very raw song raw song and so we stripped it down to match that mm -hmm. very fitting great we have the audience singing around singing around <laughs> singing around we have the audience singing along with the chorus they know every word the they're just belting it uh, of course like they want the it's a chant it's a mantra it's a meme it's a it's everyone is on the same it's wavelength very very relatable they're on Chester's wavelength. Yeah. <laughs> so this is his record. He's like annihilating it. Yeah. So this is just a nice variation, this live variation to include on the album to hear. It's, it's wonderful. We love our keys here. We love our pianos. It's awesome just to hear his raw vocals. As we said, it's this listening to this album is very much like listening to the show. Yeah. Wasn't a lot of polish or cleanup done on anything here. So it's very much like sitting in the audience and listening to Chester with the piano in the back. But just the strength of his vocals. Like if you were thinking of a show and it's like, oh, it's just one guy singing and it has to fill the whole stadium. But this, it worked. It's like you don't need a full band. You don't need anything. It's like his voice and a piano is enough to fill the whole room and just 
it's not weak at all. It's just completely as strong as any type of perf- It's like an opera or something at that point. It's just the strongest performance possible, even with just piano and vocal. Yeah, we don't have any of the deep, you know, screams that are on the original crawling. Although we forgot to mention there was an extra scream on One More Light on the live version, so he did get that in yeah, there. that's true. Which that's we true. were disappointed that there were none on the album anyway. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we've always... His vocal control is great. He always yeah. knows exactly what he's doing when he's, again, the focus of, of the track, so... Great dynamics, great version of crawling, very cool. Last thoughts on crawling. The last version. We've done crawling on this podcast probably 10 times. Remixes and live (laughs) versions. Any more thoughts about crawling in and of itself as one of the only representatives of their greatest hits first album? Just that whatever I ranked it on our first podcast is probably not high enough. (laughs) Mm, And we'll get to it. We don't remember what we ranked them, folks, because we you know now, but we don't know. <laughs> but we're going to do a recap episode. Ne- a recap. Next episode, as I already mentioned, get ready, get excited. We're, it's going to be mind-blowing. <laughs> we're not going to have any concept. We're, we've come a long way, man. Linkin Park, I'm really glad we did this, and I think it's a huge accomplishment that we did this. I love all these albums, and it was just so much fun to kind of, you know, see where they succeeded and where they failed and where they experimented and where they met our expectations or where they kind of went off the deep end, and it was interesting to take that journey, and I hope the audience enjoyed it too. Yeah. And we got... Eight more tracks of Linkin Park bringing you on home, guys. Let's do Leave Out All the Rest. Great song. It is a great song. From Minutes to Midnight, one of a few tracks from the album to make it on here. It's kind of a beautiful song. Mike sings in here. I wasn't sure if he sang on the other one as much. I think he takes one of the Chester parts, but it's cool that they both got a lead vocal part. Again, not a whole lot of Mike in the whole set. In the whole set, yeah. So it's awesome to have him here. He's got to play the keys. Yeah. (laughs) That's right. We need him back there playing. Yeah, this is really an underrated song, maybe, in the the grand scheme of things, looking back. It really is a beautiful song. I actually would have loved to hear something. It's performed just like the album version. I would have liked to hear a stripped-down version of this, I think. Yeah. Would have been nice to hear. But, you know, I'm not sure the exact order that they were performed in. But for our listening purposes for this album, to kind of pick up the pace again here with Leave Out All the Rest uh, was a good good choice to bring us back to another familiar track. Then they play Good Goodbye, which was my least favorite song from One More Light. I am kind of amazed that they tried to do this one live. It just doesn't seem like a finished song to me. There's really no hook, really. It's not... Something about it, it just feels like bits and pieces, and I felt that way on the album, and I still feel that way. And if I was cutting songs from the album to learn live, I would have cut this one first. Well, we drop out, at least in this version, I don't think Pusha T ever performed with them. So we drop out Pusha T, who was in the second verse, and we give Mike uh, a second verse that w- was not recorded for the album because originally he'd written a couple different verses for himself before deciding to include Pusha T and Storm Z onto the project. So we have Mike's original first verse. We drop Pusha T second verse for a new Mike second verse. And verse three, we still have Storm Z, who was big on the UK charts at the time. We do have him coming out to perform his third verse for this track. It's cool to have him out on the kind of European leg of the tour, so I'm sure it would have been fun to be in the audience, to have him come out to perform his, even though it's brief, a very brief piece, very brief verse, but it's not, it's just not a strong track. And I would have preferred a Fort Minor track if we're going to try and put the spotlight back on Mike. Or Um, anything from One More Light or Living, or a, (laughs) <laughs> a hundred to thousand million sons. <laughs> yeah. From any, they could have done of some of those rapper one, rappy rapper McRapperson ones on there. Yeah. Maybe it was just a fun collaboration to have Stormzy on there since they were in his neck of the woods. No, it's not. What I've done. <laughs> Track 11. <laughs> uh, this is all right. This is from One More Light, right? I mean, no. Minutes to Minutes Midnight. Minutes to Midnight, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> It's still good. It's all right. 
Well, as we start to get towards the end here, we add in our throwbacks a little bit. Our Throwback. heavy hitters here. Boom, bang. It but, hits, it bang. Oh, yeah, and it's a stadium song. It's a big festival song, as a lot of these were festivals. So, yeah, you got to hit what I've done. Get some pianos in there, dude. I think Mike's playing some pianos in there. I think Mike just sat at the piano. And never moved. <laughs> I was like, Chester, you got this, baby. <laughs> I'll come up for my two or three tracks but i'm just i'm gonna park it here joe han's doing the work though there's some good dj cuts on this thing and the guitarist sounds pretty good on this thing good cut good song then we do in the end the most famous lincoln park song still i do believe i would wager a guess kind of typical version of this nothing really but they had to do it they there was no way they weren't going to put this on here no can't miss in the end. No. Now, they could have done something weird with it. They could have done something weird with it, like they did to Crawling, but they did not. They, they could have stripped it down. They could have pushed it some electronic way. Yep. They could have added some weird... They could have. Not weird, but a scratching some baby voices, in the middle. alien voices. <laughs> yeah. But it's very straightforward. It's very in the end. It's just in the end, I think. I, yeah, it is. It's just in the end. The audience knows the words. Yes, they do. They're pretty good. They don't screw it up at all. Yeah. I kind of like when they can keep, like, in the end the way that it is without... Yeah. When they take a song like Crawling right. and do something different, which I, I think it was still cool to just strip it down, but it wasn't as banging, as heavy, as, you know, as it was originally written. Drummer's so finally keep, doing work on this thing. Well, yeah, it's in the end. We got we to gotta keep it juicy. He's getting the groove finally. Banging. Getting the sizzle finally. Yeah, exactly. Get that sizzle. Get that juice. The nice juicy steak. The meat of the band right here was in the end. Yeah, you're right. Any other thoughts? Putting it to bed in the end. One last time for the road. I think this was one of the encore pieces. I think that rotated from time to time. But yeah, it's track 12 of 16, obviously, on the album here. Just a note about that, though. Can't go to bed till you hear it in the end. That's right. It's in the end. But it's not. We got some songs to go. Sharp Edges is track 13, and this is wonderful. This is a wonderful live performance. Amazing. So you got Chester playing guitar, we found out. We looked at some of the videos. Yep, number of uh, videos out there. He is duetting with Brad, good old headphone Brad. Never takes his headphones off. Still. Even during live performances. Even when it's just him and Chester at the front of the stage. Yeah, he's always got a big beard and big hair. I mean, you're already sweating on stage. I just think you'd be dying. Was well, ears covered too? But anyways, that's a different discussion. They wrote a uh, intro to this, like an arrangement with him and Chester playing some chicken picking, some back and forth together. It sounds amazing. And then they belt it out. They do kind of the acoustic clean, just two guys standing at the front of the stage with guitars version of Sharp Edges. And it is great. And Sharp Edges lyrically was very much of a, your mama told you beware of Sharp Edges. It's very much implied by the title, and it's very much kind of the content of the song, and you could take little meanings from that if you want. But the point is, it's also kind of away from the main content of a lot of Linkin Park songs. And it can also be a very simple, stripped down kind of country song. Mm -hmm. And they kind of treat it as such here. Kind of uh, reminiscent of maybe being around a bonfire and just someone's playing the guitar and singing along. So it's kind of fun to have that portrayed that way in a different kind of Linkin Park vibe style that kind of suits the song content or the song style as well. But you're on the edge of your seat. Like, it's not weak. It's somehow the more they strip it down, the stronger and heavier it gets, where you're just like, this this is just so raw and so pretty. Like, you just want to hear the next part of the song. Like, it's it's great. It's sharp. It's a sharp edge, is main. Then they play Numb, and it's very similar to the OG Numb, right? It, it's got a touch of the the jay-z mix in there right it's the encore version yes, that's right i like that they do that because i think do. that's a throwback for the true fans to kind of catch that mix and the the samples we have from that piece of it but to still roll into the actual numb song yeah that's cool that they do put the collision course lyrics in there that's awesome they probably can't remember how to play it the other way yeah, we do have the audience singing singing along and singing part of the song as well. I'm not always a fan of that. Pay good money to come see you sing. Yep. <laughs> so I'm, I'm never a fan of that. Don't make me sing. Yeah, I'll sing along. I love right. to sing. I'll I sing can't, if I, I want. Can't, yeah, I can't not sing along. Yeah. But when you just take a verse off, I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah, don't stop singing. 
I agree. That makes a lot of sense. But it's a good song to place at the end of this album for our enjoyment. A good classic. Mike sounds a little weak on the Vokes. A little bit. Mike song sounds a little weak here and there on the parts that he shows up in. This here is, and there. It's not, not a Mike show. Not a Mike not record a Mike, at all. Not a Mike tour at all. We still got two encores left. This is not the biggest hit. We got heavy. Oh, man. This is a big one. Big, heavy one. It's okay. It's good to close with the big single from your latest album. Yeah, that's a good idea. I don't believe Kiera ever played with the full group. Mm. So we have Chester doing her vocals. Got it. So you do lose something with that. Yeah, she was quite a bit with that, actually. She was good. She should come back. Yeah, they she, should do more records with her. I don't yeah. know why they wouldn't. And now. she's a good. She was a good foil, a good contrast vocally for Chester and what he brought to the table. I thought they sounded very good together. But this is still a good live performance. It just kind of. It's still strong lyrically, and it's still strong in in kind of what we're doing in the flow of things. It's just very. It loses a lot when you're not bringing a strong vocal contrast in there. I think. The arrangement's good, though. The keys, the guitar, everything is raw and crunchy and good. Good arrangement, good mix, beautiful sounds, man. They're just crispy, good. You don't always get that good of tones of live stuff. Like, it's not, it's, sometimes it's just loud. This is, like, crispy, man. It's great. They, they really took the care of the layers of it. They practiced the layers. They practiced the dynamics. They're not all just playing and playing and playing. They're listening, locking in. It's juicy stuff. Heavy sound. This might be the best heavy. This is good. I yeah. like it more well, than some of the techno stuff. Yeah, well, I mean. Without Kiera. If it was Kiera. I mean, yes. instrumentally. Well, this is definitely one of the songs that they would have locked in on as one of the closers in the actual tour. Closers, obviously, selected for this album. But one of the songs where it's like, okay, guys, we're all playing now. This is going to be... <laughs> we're serious. moving away from, you know... We're going to get serious. We're going to actually play all the parts here, and we're going to work on this as the one of the closing tracks or the encore, whatever it was. But it's very clean. I like it. Very good. Then they do Bleed It Out. Very last song of the album of the concert of the career of the last album of lincoln park now bleed it out i think is interesting as an encore when you have mike coming out rapping getting y'all fired up then Fire you have chester up. coming over the top now i bleed it out or bleed it out i already got my lyrics phoenix up. sounds amazing too yeah. by the way very raw awesome great bass picking style so is this great as an encore or would it be better in a live show place somewhere else mm. after you're coming off some of your you know your piano songs mm. and your acoustic songs or do you would it be better as an opener yes probably that's what i think how do you, you know what do you top it with though probably they can probably top it that's the thing the last thing is like can you top this it should be the thing that it's like impossible to get that intense again well i think you have you have your natural kind of ebb and flow a little bit, even with the tracks that you're performing in a show. Yeah. So I don't know that it's necessarily topping it. I think their song's bigger than Bleeding oh, yeah. Out. So I Definitely think you have that. bigger hits, and you can certainly keep a relatively high level before you dial it down to, you know, if it's an opener, dial it down into your acoustic set, your acoustic couple sounds, songs, and you pick it back up again with Burn It Down, I don't know, with another track. They got some stuff. I just, this is, to me, at least in this particular group, for this to be one of the highest energy songs and it's at the very end, I just think that's kind of a mistake. We pretty much have listened to every Linkin Park album in a row now. We are going to still do a recap episode, but we're also going to do a mini recap right now. What do you think about Linkin? Just some thoughts. Just about this live, them live in general, this live album, the whole career, the whole, the way it began, the way it started, the way it ended, the way it might continue. What What do you think? What are you thinking about? Well, I wonder what areas they would have continued to push in. Would they have stayed in? You can't say they would have stayed in the area that they were no where way. they were bringing a little a few electronic elements in where they were kind of pushing mike vocally out a little bit and chester was more the focus of the last album you know we have got another hunting party type thing where they flip the switch mm -hmm. and we go very hard into heavy guitars heavy drums very much in a, a rock direction could have been of course we're all using loose terms rock pop but to help you know that, that's still when you say 
give it a specific genre. That still gives you some kind of, of sound. Something comes to mind, you know, although genre is very mixed nowadays. But if you're like hip hop or rock or pop, you have certain types of sounds that, that oh, come yeah. into your mind. So at least, you know, you have that pocket when you know we're, when we say that. But they're, they were purposely blurring the lines. They were. And blending it together and not making up their mind. But album to album, you could see they were in certain directions. So I wonder if they would have moved, you know, just for a next project. Yeah. Would they ever have moved more into like a hip hop pocket for a project? More towards Mike's area. Probably. You know, what other collaborations would we have seen? Would they have done another album with more writers? You know, mm-hmm. the same process, One More Light was, you know, they came in and wrote first, which was the first time they had done that. Would they have continued with that process? Would we have seen more of that from Lincoln Park? I think we would have, as opposed to coming up with some of the, the sound that they wanted first and then writing to the sound. Mm-hmm. I think we certainly would have seen a mix, seeing as they'd done it both ways and they'd been playing with sounds long before, you know, writing first. I think they should just have calmed down a little bit, like not be so they would have learned from their mistakes. They would have learned from the criticism that they got on one more light and they would have continued to evolve and they would have been able to dial it. They already did even from one more light to one more light live. They're already dialing it in more. They're already making it more accessible, more natural, more of a experience and less of like just kind of a blah pop thing. They would have, dialed it back in i hope that they would have chilled out and not really worried about i mean they're always trying to top themselves they're always trying to do something new they're always trying to exceed expectations they're always trying to Lash back push it. the envelope and the, the reactionary yeah. thing exactly they're always trying to be like oh well you think we're like this well well maybe we're like this or if you think we're like that like maybe they could have just done a record and not cared what like with the fa- quote-unquote failure critical failure of one more light where a lot of the fans didn't like it and had a backlash maybe that would have been enough for them to be like oh well who, now that we've had a, one that nobody likes now we can do whatever we want yeah I you know like finally now we right. can just do anything now finally yeah, I didn't realize in, in doing so much research for the podcast here that there was so much concern over outside yeah. forces for the band, you know, that they were so concerned about the outside perspective. Even on A Thousand Suns, like the video we watched, they're yeah. always like, how's it going to be perceived? What's it going to be? Are we going to change the world again? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be that? Yeah, I don't know if part of that's because they they documented so much, so much behind the scenes, DVDs yeah. with everything, both of live performances, behind the scenes, extra material, pretty much from the beginning. But it just seems like they had a lot of concern about things that they didn't need to as they were going platinum from the second they decided to really yeah. drop records. I mean, they had, <laughs> right. you know, once they brought Chester in to join the group and started there was no slow ascension for them. No way. They hit it out of the park yep. right away. Home They're run. A unique sound. Two vocalists. They were really across, maybe not hybrid theory right off the bat, was across multiple genres. But even with reanimation, the second album, or remix album, as you will, just are already all over the place with the sound and yeah. what they're able to do and who they're collaborating with and just all the listeners that they're able to bring in and whose attention they're capturing and what just what they're able to do. So it's just wild that they're so concerned all the time about right. outside forces. I mean, or maybe other groups are as concerned, but man, I just, when you're able to do whatever you want and you're pushing in so many directions, of course, there's going to be folks that don't like it. Right. There's going to be ones that they're not, not everybody selling, likes. Yeah, but they're not selling that many albums or doing international tours. <laughs> so well, they're not doing too bad. Yeah. They got mad that they got called sellouts, but they weren't necessarily trying to chase the trends. It was just like, this is where we're at. Like we've absorbed all these influences and we've absorbed all these different. It just sucks that one more light is kind of the end of the road because it was a step in a direction. It wasn't like, oh, we found it. This is the brand new. It was like, we're going down a road here and oh, now it's over. It felt more like a a sidestep. It wasn't the end of anything. They could have done a million of these. And their influences everywhere. Oh, yeah. With record producers, labels, rappers, rock stars, pop stars, Most inter- international band audiences. Of the 2000s. Yeah. So 
voice of a generation. Maybe. International acclaim. Yeah. Known in every country on earth. Maybe it was part of that noise that really drove them. It'll never be the same. <laughs> yeah. It'll never be that magic of the six guys. I think they should continue. I think it is still way too soon. Even four years after him passing, there's a lot of grieving left to do. But I think that the band should make more records. We talked about it on the last album, too. They got a lot of different options for that as well. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if the five members chose to get back together, how exactly it would sound, perhaps from a a vocal perspective then. Right. They could do it with the five. They could do it with guest vocalists. Yes. They could hire a sixth member or a seventh or an eighth member, or they could... And slash or they can also there's a million hours of Chester and there's a, a bunch of songs we've never heard and different takes of different songs of different pieces. You know, if they're still releasing Tupac album every year of stuff of chopped up different pieces of freestyles and verses that they put new beats to. Lincoln Parks already did that. I mean, their second album reanimation right off the bat. They're already doing that. They have already done it with Chester. Steve Aoki has released two remixes using Chester's voice after he passed to tribute Chester, of course, which is why I think it would not be disrespectful to do uh, songs we haven't heard or songs we have heard or both or vice versa. Or I think there's some Chester vocals in the vault. And that's one avenue for continuing on to make some new Linkin Park music. And or, you know, they could do it with the five. They could hire a sixth. They could have a guest guest vocalist come in and out. I just think they should do it. I think they there's still so much creativity left and it, it'll never be the same. They'll never be able to replace him. We'll miss him always. But uh, yeah. They got a lot of creativity left. I like it when bands can continue. A lot of people hate it. Like if a band, like, oh, you dare to continue without the lead singer. Like if you, if you lose the drummer, nobody cares. If you lose the lead singer, there's a certain part of the fans who like hate you. If you try to continue on and I, I like, I'm so proud of bands when they're able to continue to be creative, even after they've had a tragedy. Yeah. I think it just depends on where, it all you're, depends. where you're at. It depends where you're at creatively. I think that's a big piece of it. I think that might be a piece that's is missed is depending on the personal presence of someone, but also where you're at creatively when you lose someone that's, that's a mm-hmm. part of the team. So yeah, just, just a lot of different, different elements, obviously, emotionally, personally, but then losing part of that creative team and how you move forward with that as well. And on the less sensitive you know, not to sound less sensitive, but on that side of things, how you move on with either a different mind in the room or just short, one less creative mind. Neither is ideal, Obvi- yeah. obviously, because they didn't change members. So both of those situations is wrong because they never had to fire anyone and they hi- they had new writers on One More Light. I, I don't know if that uh, helped them or hurt them necessarily, but they probably might have taken a step back from that. It's the way that pop records are written, and Mike even says it on the one behind-the-scenes thing we watched, where he's like, oh, every record that comes out has, like, 15 writers on it. and it's like, And he's not saying it, and you hear that a lot in a negative way. Like, you hear it like, oh, this Beyonce song has, like, 10 writers, and it sucks. And it's like, how did, like, nine people have to... Two verses. Right, right, this repetitive... Thing. I don't know, man. I don't think they need ghostwriters. I think the five of them are, are creative as hell, and we'll see what happens. It's when the time is right, if the time is right. Mike is like a famous streamer now. He does yep. records on live streams and jams and makes beats and does cuts and does all kinds of stuff. And still drops material. Yeah, absolutely. It might be up to the other members. They're going to say, hey, Mike, we need to get paid. We need to go to her. <laughs> And Mike will have to say, all right, brothers. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But certainly we love love all those guys. Next time we'll certainly uh, do a little wrap-up show. We'll see what the hell we rated everything because I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After going through everything here, we'll certainly uh, do a little wrap-up here, run through our, our final mix CD lists. Yes. And we're going to put that on Spotify for you guys. Yeah. 
thoughts. We'll uh, we'll catch you next time on our final wrap up and our final final thoughts on Lincoln Park. And we love you, and we love Lincoln Park, and we love Chester. Rest in peace forever, forever, Smooches. man. Smooches, pooches.